Good evening. Welcome to the March 11th, 2021 meeting of the Jacksonville Water and Sewer Advisory Committee. Um, we have a call to order, which I've just done already. And the first order of business is the adoption of tonight's agenda. If we could have a motion to adopt or amend the agenda. I'll make that motion. I will second the motion to adopt the agenda. Uh, all right. All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? <clears throat> So be it. Our next order of business is a consideration of the minutes of our last meeting, which for the record was November 12th, 2020. It was a tour of the city water plant. Um, can I have a motion to adopt, correct, or reject the minutes? I'll make a motion. I'll, I'll second it. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? All right, motion carried. Tonight's order of business is we have a presentation of the capital improvement plan by Public Services Director Wally Hansen. Wally? Good evening. We appreciate everybody being able to make it tonight. I know we unfortunately haven't been able to meet as much as we would regularly meet, and of course that's following COVID protocols. Um, what I will say is tonight we have uh, before you the capital improvement plan for FY22. If you'll recall over the last couple of years, what we've done is break this up into several meetings so it's not so much to digest all at one meeting. And then, you know, at the end of those series of meetings, get your support or recommendation to city council on the full capital improvement plan. What I'd like to, for you to consider tonight as we go through this is um, maybe breaking that tradition a little bit. What, I'll, what I would like to do tonight is concentrate on the FY22 projects. And the reason for that is in the FY22 budget that is coming up, uh, that's the projects that are actually adopted. Those are the projects that are funded. Those are the projects that impact the budget. And then what we would like to do is bring the rest of the CIP back to you, um, which would be those, you know, that nine year, that additional nine year planning window at your April meeting and ask for your support of those as well um, and any guidance or anything related to that. So uh, where we've traditionally done this in two or three meetings broken up and then one kind of recommendation or support at the end of that. What I'd like to do is break this up so that, you know, if for some reason we're unable to meet in April, at least we've reviewed the most important projects, which is those in the FY22 uh, plan or program year and then in the budget. So with that, just a, a quick reminder, uh, the capital improvement plan is a 10-year uh, document that uh, programs and plans water and sewer, as well as other projects, streets, sidewalks, stormwater projects, recreation projects, uh, police and fire projects. Uh, this board focuses on the water and sewer projects because that is the projects that are supported and calculated into the water and sewer fees that people pay monthly, as well as our system development fees. So we use this 10-year planning window, um, as I mentioned, for the system development fees. And that is key because that, there's actually legislation that states that in order for you to use projects for system development fees, they have to be programmed into um, a 10-year plan. So we comply with state law um, as a result. So uh, if you'll recall back before 2018, we had a five-year capital improvement plan that we'd actually put in place in 2007. So we were ahead of the curve when it came to programming um, capital improvement projects. We just moved to a 10-year plan following the law change for a 10-year plan. And then um, this plan is updated annually and reviewed annually. Only the first year of the plan is adopted. We call that the program year. Um, those are the projects that are actually funded. And then the rest of the projects fall into what we call the planning window. Uh, you know, in the, in the first, you know, 
two to three years of the plan, we put a lot of focus. We're following master plans um, in programming projects. When you get to the nine and 10 year, we're still following master plans, but we're using uh, budgetary numbers provided as part of those master plans. We haven't done, you know, a detailed scope of a project. You know, we haven't narrowed a project down from three alternates to one, uh, like we have in, in some of the earlier projects. So that's why it's a planning window. Um, and again, tonight, uh, because only the first year is funding, that's what I would look to support from um, for the FY22 projects. Question for clarity? Uh, sure. Uh, fiscal year 22, that begins July 1? July 1 of 2021 and ends June 30 of 2022, which is why we refer to it as fiscal year 22. Thank you. So what makes a capital improvement project? We talked about the plan is a culmination of projects. Um, what makes a project is, a, is something that is in, either an improvement, a rehabilitation, has a useful life of more than five years. Um, it traditionally takes 12 months or more to uh, plan, design, and construct this, um, that type of improvement. And um, it's, again, it ranges from replacement of existing infrastructure where you have, you know, deteriorated water or sewer lines that are starting to fail and show problems in streets, which we were talking about earlier, mm -hmm. or, you know, lift stations or even portions of our water or wastewater treatment plant that need um, improvement or rehabilitation. We'll talk about a couple of those tonight. And then it also uh, talk. It, it also looks at what do we need to either upgrade in our existing system, or build new, to be able to handle growth in the future. And uh, those go together, and we use them um, as part of as part of our rate model, which Sabrina uh, from finance was nice enough to come in and kind of give you a financial overview of what these projects will, will mean at the end. Um, but then that helps us set not only our water and sewer rates that people pay monthly, but also those system development fees that developers pay as they build houses or restaurants or hotels or apartments or any other type of development. So all of these projects go into those calculations. So with that, um, we use, for when we're looking at replacing or rehabilitating infrastructure, we use our mobile work system. Uh, it's mobile 311. We track and digitally or GPS locate um, any water main breaks, sewer breaks, uh, anytime we get called to a resident's house because of um, a meter issue or anything along those lines. Uh, related to maintenance, <laughs> utility maintenance of our water and sewer system. Um, this includes our wastewater lift stations, and we're actually starting to, to do um, parts of our plant and track um, some of the assets at our plant. But you can see that um, over the last year, utilities maintenance, which is Anthony's crews, have responded to 163 water service leaks 38 main breaks, um, 54 turnoff valve requests, which is typically done by metering. And then we've installed four meters and repaired nine valves. And that's done with a crew of roughly 28 people, I believe. So they're busy. Um, they also do sewer repairs. So this is the last year of sewer repairs. And when I say year, um, we're talking, I, I ran this report last week, so from last week back one year, um, we've done 168 sewer service repairs. We've uh, cleared 132 sewer backups. Um, those were on our side. Unfortunately, if they're on the private homeowner's side and we get there and we investigate and determine that it's on their side, they are responsible. But those are the ones that we've cleared. And then we've replaced 46 clean-out caps. Again, we do that to prevent inflow and infiltration 
into our sewer system so we keep that rainwater out so we don't have to treat it. And then we've um, cleared 25 main blockages. So with yes, the clean out caps, you know, if we see one broken or if a homeowner sees one broken because it's been hit by a lawnmower or weed whack or something along those lines, who do if they, they call? call us, if they call us, we'll replace it for free. They can call the main number at City Hall, which is 938-5200, uh, um, or they can call Derek or Barisha directly, which is 938-5249. Thank you. And we will come out and replace that because we want to prevent that sewer from getting into our system. Sorry, that rainwater from getting into our sewer system. We also, when we're looking at um, any upgrades or new construction that we need to do as a result of um, growth, we use uh, things, and I know you've seen this slide several times now in talking about the Western Regional Truck Sewer and, and some of the other projects, but uh, this just gives you an idea of what we track. And this is how we use to uh, program projects. And, you know, 500 single family homes aren't going to build out over the next year. But if we need to make major improvements in our water and sewer system, we can't make those in a year either. So we have to, we try to track very closely um, so that we are prepared for growth but we also don't want to be too far ahead of growth where we've taken on um, improvements that do cost us and not be getting recovery back on those. Because um, anything that you see in the water and, uh, sorry, in the capital improvement plan that is programmed to accommodate for growth, whether it's a lift station that's existing, we're replacing it, but we're going to upsize it so it can handle more or if it's a completely new lift station or a new line somewhere, um, that is calculated into our system development fees. And then we do, we use that information to do system modeling and planning. And I know, again, you've seen this several times, but this is the Henderson Basin. Um, that basin is very close to capacity. And as you can see, just from those numbers, we still have 330 acres of undeveloped land in that, that basin that is actually within city limits and another 680 acres of future areas that could come into the city as some sort of development. And then the Brookview, so you, we're really talking about the two basins that are uh, around Western Boulevard and Gum Branch. That's where we see the most potential for growth net right now. And you can see that in that area, we have 790 acres of undeveloped and then another 850 that could potentially come into that basin. So we use all of that information, what, what we're having to repair now, where we're seeing um, deteriorating infrastructure, as well as where future growth is coming. And we try to use that to program these projects that you're going to review. Um, you trying to stick with kind of a, a familiar format. Uh, we'll stick with the, the water is blue, the sewer is green, and then the, the combined, which are both water and sewer projects, um, as a purple. And then we have the, the Gantt chart, which we've seen a few times, which is, um, tells you what year the planning is done in, the design, and then the construction. Again, I, I left that in there because we'll likely um, use that in the next discussion. And, um, but you can see that what you'll see is that most of those projects or all of those projects are either going to be design in 22 or construction in 22. Because again, that's what we're looking at funding. There's, tonight we're gonna review a total of 19 projects. Uh, two are related to North Carolina Department of Transportation projects. So those are water and sewer projects uh, that we might not would otherwise take on, but because we do have water and sewer lines within DOT right-of-ways, anytime they do a project, we are required to move or adjust our projects. Um, we have seven water, eight sewer, and then to combined water and sewer. And <clears throat> many of these you may recognize because 
they are included from last year. So, you know, they're either projects that we've already started because they were identified in previous capital improvement plans, or they are projects that we are planning to start this year, but we were planning for those already. Um, I'll give you um, a snap preview. We have two that are new projects that um, we're introducing into the CIP. Yes, sir. Well, <clears throat> when you talked about the NCDOT projects and you said that you're required to move the project, were you referring to moving the scheduling of the project or were you referring to moving the actual construction, where the, the pipes go and that type of thing? What In moving? most cases, we've, we have to physically move the location of the pipes. So we have to move, you know, whatever infrastructure we have in. In most cases, what we do is uh, enter into an agreement where DOT designs it. We pay for it, but they design it as part of their project and then move it as part of our as part of their project, but we have to fund it. But it does take pressure off our staff because we don't have to design or construct it. And if um, if you'll recall, several years ago, we actually had five or six DOT projects that we were looking at. Of those five or six, I think it was six. Um, four have moved out, and we have these two left. So if their funding is delayed by us doing it this way it enables us to delay our funding as well. <clears throat> so tonight what we'll do is we'll start with the DOT projects. The first one is the widening of Gum Branch Road. Anybody that lives or has even driven through Onslow County down this road knows that this needs to be done. Um, it would widen the roadway. What they're looking at is widening the roadway from Somersill School Row, where the stoplight is, and turns into two, well, I guess it's technically three lanes, um, to uh, just east of the uh, city limits line of Richlands. And we have our 16-inch main that runs right through there. It's actually under the travel lane now. Um, and I can tell you for the estimated cost that they've given us, we are obviously not relocating that whole 16 inch um, water main. What we're having to do is make adjustments in areas where we have conflicting utilities, whether that be you know, an existing stormwater pipe that has to be adjusted or the grade of the road or something of those along those lines. Um, so this would cover those conflicts along that stretch. And our our 16 inch water main runs from in town all the way to Rock Creek. Actually runs to Gum Branch Central. I have a question. Yes, ma'am. You said they would do the design, but you've got money for design in here. We still have to pay for that design. They just include it in their whole plan. That's correct. Okay, thank you. Yes, ma'am. And then Commerce Road, uh, DOT is planning to extend Commerce Road, where it terminates now, um, all the way out to Piney Green Road. And this would, um, we're actually, this is one that we asked to be included. Because right now we have a water line on Commerce Road and it comes up, I believe, Fairway. And then we have a water line that comes down um, a portion of Piney Green Road to serve North Marine Town Center um, which has, uh, you know, the Toyota dealership and um, I don't remember if it's a Circle K, but the gas station right there on the corner. We serve that, um, but right now what we do is we serve it off of a main that runs to them and it, it is not looped back into our system. So this would actually provide, this extension would provide a loop back into our system for that main. Wally, what has um, some of the cost changes of materials done to some of these uh, prices for the construction? We do try to, um, actually right now we're seeing on the projects we've gotten back, we're seeing good competitive bids. Okay. So, but you know, when we're looking in out years, we do, we try not to overdo it. We, we try to be conservative and we use um, somewhere between two to 3% for inflation. So, you know, we'll take, uh, when we're developing a budget for a project, we scope the project the best we can. And like I said, a, a project that's further out that may have 
three or four routes that you could take, it's a, you know, it's a little bit more difficult. But when we know the scope of the project, we actually take bid prices that we've recently received and we go through that project. Um, and what we're finding right now is we have very good prices. Okay. And these, uh, what I will say is the DOT um, projects were provide estimates provided to us from DOT. So moving on to water projects, uh, the FY21 water line project was actually in the capital improvement plan already. Uh, this is an ongoing replacement of older deteriorated water lines. We use mobile 311 to kind of guide this. So when you look in the CIP, there's not specific roads listed um, because, you know, it's hard to predict in five years which roads we're going to need to replace water lines on. Um, but we've been talking with utilities maintenance, and one of the areas we need to look at is the um, Lakewood area. Uh, we don't know how or why, but Lakewood actually has, or sections of Lakewood have two water lines along it. Um, there's a six inch on one side, and for whatever reason, a two inch galvanized on the other. And we have a lot of problems with the two inch galvanized. We go out there multiple times to fix it. Um, and that's kind of in that upper left hand corner of that small picture. It may not look like there's a lot of dots there, but what I can tell you is that there's three or four under one. So because we're repairing all in the same area. So what Anthony's thinking we probably need to do is go cut that two inch galvanized loose and tie all of those homes into the six inch that's already there. Uh, and then we'll start looking at um, other challenges that are generally in that area, but we may not limit it just to the Lakewood area. Wally, how um, old are the lines in that area? I'm not sure. Okay. Mr. Thomas, do you remember when? Long time ago. <laughs> <laughs> so I, I would, you know, I would guess 40 or 50 years. Okay. Uh, this is a project that we've been working on for a while. Um, you can see that we've completed the planning work, if you'll recall, and I know we've talked about this project again a couple of times because it has been in our capital improvement plan a while. Um, we originally had a project to renovate some well houses, and I think it was well houses two, three, and four. Um, and when we went out there and looked at renovating those well houses, we decided, you know, if we're going to spend this much money renovating well houses, we should camera those wells. Well, when we cameraed them, um, we got some not so great news. And basically, the recommendation from the consultant was, um, you know, I wouldn't recommend putting, investing this much money to upgrade well houses over wells that you're going to have um, in some way already did have problems with. Um, so what we did is we went back to well one, which we had not been using uh, for a period of time, and we camered it, and well one was actually in great shape. And um, there were there have been challenges through the years with well one. We really hadn't been using it because we were having trouble uh, keeping it on, um, we had trouble keeping it on uh, from from kicking off from pressure. Uh, and we think some of that is the way the piping developed over the years. So uh, this project will actually be to um, redo well one, uh, put a new pump in it, um, redo the piping on well one, and then um, put it back into service. Uh, in doing that, if you'll recall, we had a truck drive through the chlorine station at 258 several years ago. Um, that's how we would have served, fed chlorine in. Um, so we'll have to add a chlorine station at well one. And then as a, um, in later years, uh, we would go back and look at wells two through four. And we're actually talking with Dr. Sproul about the option of um, consolidating those, eliminating um, you know, those three wells, and then potentially um, just putting one Black Creek well to replace those. So um, 
you know, we've, we've had preliminary conversations with the state. They've been supportive of that. So that is something that we look forward um, in the, you know, hopefully coming in the near future. And then we do have an option to add an additional monitoring well into that. Um, with the wells that we've put in recently at Burton Park, you know, we put in uh, Black Creek monitoring wells, Castle Hayne monitoring wells, and a Cape Fear monitoring well at Burton Park, which is in relative proximity to this. We're thinking that may not be necessary, but it is something that we did build into the scope of the project. Wally, <clears throat> does the cost and the project include the wet, uh, well one well house upgrade renovation it does thank you so that would be all inclusive what's the time frame of getting this done once they start uh the well one should be pretty quick once we get um they're they're designing the project now uh and i believe that is wk dixon wk dixon is designing that for us um, that we will have a few challenges. I think we're going to have to obtain an easement that we don't currently have. We are going to have to bore under Highway 24, um, so we'll need encroachment agreements. Um, but, you know, I, we're hoping to get construction started on this project um, hopefully next year, so in FY22. So the wells you have now, you're not worried about them for a better word, just crapping out. <laughs> yeah, we have su sufficient capacity now. Yes, okay. sir. Is that well, one to five? Is five the new one you're thinking of? No, five, we do have a well five. It's just further down Wells Road. We have uh, on well, well one is not technically on Wells Road. It's just past Wells Road. But on Wells Road, we have two, three, four, and five. Are you planning on replacing five, or what are you going to do with it? Well, five is the one that we had originally looked at converting to a monitoring well because mm -hmm. it's not um, a large producing Black Creek well. Mm -hmm. uh, but we'll we'll have to revisit that. Okay. Um, the next project is one that we added in uh, to the CIP last year. It was a new project that we put planning and design in FY21, which would be the current budget year that we're in. And this was based off um, problems that we were having in the Branchwood area. Uh, the mains seem to be in pretty good shape, but we have a lot of problems with the services in the Branchwood area. And I didn't update the numbers. Those numbers were from last year. So admittedly, I stole that slide. Um, but they, at last year, we had done 64 service leaks. I probably should have updated that number, so I apologize. But we continually have uh, problems in the Branchwood area. And that's one that we, we talked about a lot last year because it was a new introduction into the capital improvement plan. What I will say is we have not started on this project yet. Um, part of the reason, as you'll recall, we did not know where we would end up with um, everything going on um, as a result of COVID. So we did not release all of our funding right away while it was available to us. We did not move forward with it. Um, and uh, I believe Sabrina actually came to one of your previous meetings and kind of presented that we were fine that, you know, the um, worries that we had were, um, we were in good shape, so we didn't have um, major revenue losses or anything like that. So while we've now freed up that funding to move forward, um, this is one that we will be moving <laughs> forward with. We just have to get it assigned and get staff to focus on it. The Ellis water tank upgrade is also one that we added in last year. Uh, this is in the same boat funding-wise. It's funding funded. Uh, we just haven't moved forward with it yet, um, and we plan to, to begin. We, we're not sure where we're going to go yet on this project. If you'll recall, um, this tank is currently not in service, and we just use it for um, cellular the right tank? No. It's Brimmar, right? I apologize. This should say Brimmar. 
I realized that as I was saying it, and mm -hmm. I'm like, that didn't make sense. It should be Bryn Mawr, and I think it's titled wrong in your CIP also. Mm -hmm. um, but it, it should actually say Bryn Mawr. We'll get that corrected for you. Uh, but the Bryn Mawr tank um, is currently not in service because of the level of the commons tank, the elevation of the commons tank. So what happens is when you have water in Bryn Mawr, you can't get it back out. Um, so really the benefit to our system right now is that it has cellular leases on it, which completely cover the cost of the maintenance and everything else associated with the tank. But we need to do some repairs at the commons tank. And to do that, we're gonna have to take the commons tank offline for a short period of time. And if we're going to do that, we wanna make sure that this tank is in, um, provides assistance to that area above what just the, the water treatment plant would. So that is the reasoning behind this. Um, we've looked at a couple of options. One is to add a booster station, which is we leave the tank at the same level. You just add a, a station that's got pumps in it that overcomes the, you know, that adds to the pressure um, such that we move water back and forth. The only challenge is with that is you have constant O&M associated, you know, operation and maintenance expense. You'll have electricity for the pumps, maintenance for the pumps, for the intakes, um, you know, all of the controls that go along with that. Um, so one other option we're looking at is possibly raising the tank. And there are companies that do that. They'll, they'll come in and, you know, physically raise that tank in the air higher such that, you know, the height is sufficient to provide pressure back into the system. Gravity. How much higher does it need to go if they did that? I can't answer that. Okay. We haven't looked at that yet. Well, it's, it, it's partially right, though, because when, to do the maintenance on the commons tank, Ellis becomes the high side tank. And it would be a lot easier to do with, if it was actually the Bryn Mawr tank. Ellis is way too low. Um, you, you, there's just not enough pressure with it. So we, we would have to get the Bryn Mawr back online to actually have some pressure on that side if the commons needs it. That was just one good. So I'll repeat what Joe said, um, just for the, so that, the, make sure the mics picked him up. What he's saying is while Ellis does become on the high side when we do that, when we, if we take the commons offline, the problem is Bryn Mawr is still too low. So this should be Bryn Mawr. And if we raise it up, then Bryn Mawr becomes usable again. Or if we add booster station. What have you got to do at Commons? Just work inside the tank. Oh. And that's, we have that tank under asset management. So the asset management company will do all of that work and they have it programmed. And if Joe would take it offline tomorrow, they would start. We just want to make sure that we're in a good situation before we decide to do that. <laughs> you don't want your phone ringing. They <laughs> <laughs> need a lot of time to do what they need to do at the Commons tank. It's going to be off for a while, the Commons yes. tank? Yes. <coughs> and we have um, the Gum Branch Central Chlorine Station. If anybody that's driven down Gum Branch Road knows, there's been um, continued development in the Rock Creek area. There's a brand new gas station right on the corner of Roadstown Road and um, Gum Branch Road. And they've cleared land right beside our building. You used to not be able to see it from the neighborhood or or from the road, and now as you drive, you can see um, our Gum Branch Central Station. Uh, we we do feed chlorine at that station. Uh, we do have safety protocols, but um, in evaluating with the growing area, we think that it would be best if we just went ahead and put some sort of containment type of scrubber system there. So that's what this project is for. This project is new to the capital improvement plan this year. So it's proposed for the um, FY22 budget, and that's both uh, design and construction. About six weeks ago, we had a situation at the water treatment plant where we lost communication and we actually, it took the plant out of service. Um, you know, it was a brief period of time we had plenty of water 
to meet demand and we could have run the plant manually if we needed to we would have just had to have brought some operators in um, we worked with it to try to solve the problem and it ended up finding out that we have um, you know the the plant is the plant and the wells are all controlled from one control room but that requires for lack of a better term remote controls to do it and those those run through what we call a programmable logic circuit, which the only thing I can tell you is it's a little box about this big and it has inputs and outputs on it. And it interprets what the, you know, if, if the operators are saying turn a pump on, then it goes through that and it sends out the signal and that's what turns the pump on. And there's one on each end, one at the plant and one out in the, the well field or one, you know, in the plant and one on the equipment in the plant to, to receive and interpret. The problem is what happened is the, um, those were installed in the 2000, well, they were put in service in 2010, so they were probably installed prior to that. And the, the challenge that we have is the idea behind them were they were kind of plug and play. So if, if one failed, you pulled it out, you put a new one in, and you programmed it. And it's, you know, kind of like a little mini computer. The challenge we have is we can no longer get those so they don't physically fit where we need to put them. And the ones that we have are beginning to fail. Um, and while IT is able to keep those operational and we do have some that we're continuing to switch out and keep going, we need to replace all of those at the plant. Um, and then there's discussion of, you know, what we'll have to do, whether we can do them one at a time at the well houses. Um, you know, the idea is if we take a bunch of them, you know, there's, I can tell you, I've looked in the cabinet, there's more than 50 in that cabinet. So if we pull those out, it may be that we can use those in the wells um, and replace them as needed and, and kind of have a rolling stock for at least a short period of time. Will they be compatible with the newer models? We're hoping. Okay. That's what we don't know yet. Okay. That's well, a great question. Was this part of the SCADA or the water plant itself? It's, uh, so the, the, Joe, can you help me what SCADA stands for? The SCADA is basically the, the controls that you have. These are physical components in the water plant, in, inside a cabinet. So it's the water plant. When the water plant was built, they were installed. Yes, yes sir. Yes, there's, you know, for, you know, it, it seems odd, but what I will say, it's a, an industrial environment and it's a computerized piece of equipment that we've been able to get more than 10 years out of. So, you know, they are getting up to the place where we have to life cycle them. The real challenge is the new models aren't the same physical size as the old models. Is the room big enough? Yes. Okay. Yes. Yep. This is also a new um, project that we're proposing for. So I was wrong. There's technically three. Uh, this is a new project that we're proposing for uh, fiscal year 22. Um, what we would like to do, as you as you went to the plant on. Um, in November and had the tour, if you'll recall, um, we talked about how the raw water comes into the plant, goes through the cartridge filters, and then it goes through the trains and is sent out, it's treated and sent out to the mixing tank. But if you'll recall, we, we mentioned that um, we have a bypass line that takes roughly about 10% of that water and bypasses the cartridge filters and trains and goes right to the mixing tank. And that is to add, you know, that's to add some of those minerals and um, taste and back into the water that we've treated. And that's how it was designed. But one of the things that we've noticed as we change out cartridge filters is it's not uncommon to have, you know, things such as sand and, and those kind of things that come in from the wells and those cartridge filters, and that's what they're there for. 
But as we thought about it, well, we realized, well, if you're taking 10% of that water that's coming in and bypassing those and send them directly to uh, the, the uh, mixing tank where we have the odor control and where we mix everything in, um, you know, we realized that some of that sand and other things that are coming in that we're getting out with those cartridge filters could be bypassing and going into our tank, which means over time we will have to go in and clean the tank and those kind of things. So what we'd like to do is um, put cartridge filters along that bypass line. You know, we're, we're still not going to send it through the treatment trains or anything like that. But what we would need to do is find a physical locating, a uh, physical location to locate. If you remember those silver canisters that had the lug nuts on the front, we had one open and looked like a, a stick of yarn that came out. Uh, find a physical location for that. And again, the, the idea is there, you're just taking some of those larger things out of the water so we don't have to deal with them either in the um, bio scrubbers or in the mixing tank. Moving to sewer, this is a project that you've seen a number of times. Um, if you'll recall, in your the last month we sent out, um, I think it was last month, we sent out the Water and Sewer Advisory Committee uh, report that you get, and we, we informed you that Council had given us the approval to move forward with this project. Um, we have uh, the design, the planning design, easements and permits with the exception I think one permit that we have to get extended all in hand for um, the Western Regional project uh, again that project includes force main that will uh, be put in place from a new pump station set kind of in the Williamsburg plantation area uh, and it will carry wastewater directly out to the land treatment site and it will intercept um, existing flow that goes through the uh, Henderson and Brookview basins and take it directly out to the land treatment site and allow for additional um, growth in the future. So this is one of those projects that it is bond funded, but it's also included in our system development fee calculation. So those portions that are attributable to growth will be refunded over time as development builds out. And we hope to have uh, at least the first phase of the force main, which will be that piece that you see in orange or yellow on the screen. And that should be out to bid at the beginning of April. And then the idea behind that would be to follow 45 days later with the uh, piece that is in red. So that would get the force main under construction and then we would set the pump station next and start working on the trunk sewer. The Decatur pump station abandonment is uh, a project that we uh, started with a, a planning concept to actually take the Decatur pump station offline uh, right now, it is a shallow wet well set right next to a, a creek, and it has suction lift pumps in it. So um, one of the challenges with suction lift pumps is they have to be primed. So if they lose prime or if they um, develop an airlock, then they don't pump, and we have a very short time period to respond. Um, when we started looking at this, somebody realized that as um, Williams Farm had developed out that there was a sewer line with existing easements uh, kind of behind Williams Farm that ties into the trunk sewer that goes to Brookview Lift Station. We did some preliminary shots and realized that it may be possible to completely eliminate this station, set new gravity sewer, and carry it to the Brookview line. Uh, and it's only about 1,700 feet away, as you can see from the slide. So um, the Parker and Associates looked at that, determined that it was possible, and designed that uh, project. 
And this project is, has it been a it, we, we bid it. We only had two bidders. We're required to have three to open. So we'll have to rebid the project. Um, so it'll be out for another roughly month, and then we'll determine whether we can open or um, what we'll need from, to do from there. So this project is moving forward. And the great thing about that is, you know, it does help with operation and maintenance costs because we will no longer have electricity and pump maintenance, um, like, you know, electronics and everything else that we have to maintain associated with this. So it'll essentially become a gravity system. I wish we could do a lot more this way. Uh, Holiday City Mobile Home Park uh, lift station is another one that we've talked about several times. If you'll recall, the owner of the, list, uh, of the, the mobile home park um, began working with the city several years ago to limit and eliminate some of the inflow and infiltration uh, coming from the park. They did a study. They actually employed an engineering firm to do a study. They implemented the findings of the study. Um, we noticed some benefit, but you're always going to have some I and I. Uh, we still think there is I and I that could possibly be eliminated, uh, but that owner that was cooperating sold the property, and you know that's something that we'll have to go back and and revisit. Um, that said, the mobile home city pump state uh, uh, pump station is also another shallow wet well near a stream, suction lift pumps. And it's one that we do have problems with periodically. Um, it's in talking with Anthony, it is something that we do need to replace. If you'll recall, uh, we originally looked at not only replacing this station, but we were going to upgrade it some to handle those spikes that we were seeing. We're thinking we may not have to do that because of the work that was done. And maybe we can do a little additional work um, to ensure that but we do need to go ahead and start moving forward with this project. We have design money currently available. We'll probably kick off the design, which will come with an analysis of that uh, pump station and the, you know, a, a detailed flow study. Uh, so we'll probably get that kicked off this year and maybe begin construction in FY22. You said the property was sold to a new owner? Yes, sir. Still going to stay the same as it is, though? I believe so. Park. That that It's changed owners two or three times in the last okay. few years. Does that lift station pump into Bryn Mawr? It correct? does. Okay. It pumps into Bryn Mawr. Yes, ma'am. That's not that far away. No, it's not. Yeah. But we can't get there by gravity, unfortunately. That's what I was wondering. <laughs> no. It, it is in a very low area. Mm-hmm. The Ellis pump station is a project that we've talked about a couple of times. That picture is from Hurricane Florence. Um, it, there's not much more that needs to be said. It was flooded. It damaged. <laughs> it damaged a lot of the equipment inside. It damaged all of the equipment that we had on the outside, including the biofilter, the generator, and a bypass pump that we had set up. The good news is that we did receive... Um, funding from FEMA to help cover some of those uh, costs. There is a requirement, though. We have to, um, for lack of a better term, flood-proof the station. You know, we have to do a resiliency uh, planning effort. That is already in progress. Uh, we have an outside engineer uh, working on this project. Um, and we have, I don't remember the number exactly, but I want to say we really, we received um, six or seven hundred thousand dollars from FEMA to help with the station. Is the cost listed here above that money from FEMA? The cost, yes, the cost will be above the FEMA cost. I'm sure. So you had seven hundred thousand dollars to the eight hundred forty-one thousand. Okay. Yes. Thank you. And then the, <clears throat> interestingly enough. If you recall, I believe it was two years ago, we came to you with a uh, project to replace the biofilters at Ellis and at Bremmar. Those stations, uh, 
look the same, operate the same, were built at the same time under the same set of plans. Both of the biofilters were failing and insufficient to get the air exchanges we needed to remove the hydrogen sulfide gas. Um, what I can tell you is hydrogen sulfide gas is very tough on the equipment, especially the electrical equipment, and on the concrete walls of the lift station. So um, if you remember at that time, we had done a preliminary study and found that the cost to replace the biofilters were was larger than we had budgeted. We ask you to separate that project and move Ellis forward first and then Brimmar. And you actually ask us to look and make sure that that was okay, and we did. Um, and then Florence happened and Ellis flooded. Uh, but this is the follow-up to that project. Uh, we do have uh, money for money for both planning and um, design, and that is underway currently. And Seminole Trail is a, a project that was added last year into the capital improvement plan. This is a, a section of roadway that began following Hurricane Florence. Uh, began showing uh, major dips and sinkholes in the road. We camered it and found that um, the line had to be replaced. So we added this line into um, the capital improvement plan to be replaced. The Little Creek Pump Station is a, is a project that has been in the capital improvement plan several years now. Um, this project is tied to development in the Western Boulevard and um, Ramsey Road area. If that, um, if that development does not move forward, then this project would not move forward. Um, this project is one of those that will be covered by um, what we call uh, sewer service area fees. And um, if you recall, several years ago, we um, introduced a concept to city council whereby when you have a development in an overall larger basin, uh, we can assist with development in that basin by providing funding to help uh, construct some of the backbone infrastructure. And this has been done a couple of times. Um, one example of that was Springdale lift station when we we constructed it, and then another was North Marine Town Center out off Piney Green and um, uh, Highway 17. And that's done through agreement whereby um, as somebody ties in, they, they pay a cost above and beyond what the system development fee is, such to pay back this um, project completely. And again, this will be tied to um, a development agreement so that if the development doesn't move forward, then the project doesn't move forward. Um, so far, the, the project is currently in design, as is the development. Um, part of the requirement is that the, um, at least a portion of that, that basin had to be annexed uh, into city limits, and it was. Um, so we moved forward with design, but there's other things that have to happen for this to move forward. No enterprise fund money will be on this project? Well, it, so water and sewer will cover the upfront cost, but it's paid back over time. Okay. And it's paid back at 100%, including the planning and design money. And what is over time, 20 years? Uh, it depends how long the development, I mean, the basin takes to develop out could be five, it could be 20. That's part of trying to be careful to put milestones in place and those kind of things that the developer has to hit. Thank you. When you say paid back, is that with 100% development? Yes, yes sir. Okay. So while the water and sewer fund will upfront the cost, we recover over time 100% of what the water and sewer fund invested. If 100% of what you're, you're projecting is done? Yes. Yes, sir. Question. Is there yes, any kind of insurance if something falls through? The agreement. We, we put an agreement in place. 
So if it falls through, I, I don't remember what we did on. You know, I, I don't remember what we did on prior. We've done this two other times and it's worked well. Um, and I don't remember what I don't remember whether there was a surety or bonding or okay. or what behind it. But there is something there to ensure that the city recovers the money. And ultimately, even if it takes 50 years to build out, we would recover the money eventually because anything that tied into it would have to pay back. But we still tie it to that development agreement. Okay. Well, yeah, I would like to point out, though, even though we will recover the money over time, by upfronting it, it puts pressure on the rates because that's money. Unless with the enterprise they were collects playing. enough money that the rates don't have to go up, this will be pressure to raise the rates because you're putting that money up front. There could be pressure, yes, sir. That's... And then we have the inflow and infiltration project. And I'll talk a little bit more about um, this program. If you'll recall, this is an ongoing program that we have. We, we call it our find and fix. We try to find it in one year and start fixing it in the next year. Um, in practicality, what we're seeing happen is it really takes us about three years. It takes us a year to go through and do all of the camera work that's required identify the pipes that and the types of repairs that we need, bid it out, and then for the contractor to come through and do the work. So what we've done, which you'll see um, it, when we review the uh, planning window for the capital improvement plan at your next meeting, you'll see that we put a one-year break in there. We want to make sure that this program stays in there, but we want to be realistic about, again, the money that we're programming and we're spending so that we don't put pressure on a rate earlier than we really need to. Um, and that's really putting that one year break in there kind of really matches more in practice what we're seeing. And we actually have a project that will be going to city council for award at their Tuesday meeting for um, about a five or $600,000 um, I and I project. And the good thing is it came in under our estimated budget, which was right at the top of our money that we had available. So we're seeing good prices right now. Um, the idea there is if we're able to, we would like to take advantage of the prices we have. So what we may be able to do is as we're working, identify other sections in the areas we're working and change order that into the project. Um, and as I say that, Sabrina's going like this. <laughs> but, but the idea is that we're able to take advantage of the good bid prices that we have and the money that we have available. Wally, is the I&I program got good equipment? Is the smoke in the camera and the truck and all that is still not something that we're worried about as a capital investment? It is, they, it is all in good shape, yes, sir. And we do... Um, we do our camera truck runs almost daily. Well, that's why I asked, Unless it's because not, it's not a brand new and you run it every day. Yes. At some point in the capital plan, you'll have to replace I it. I think we replaced it one or two years ago. Do you remember? I think it was two years ago now. Um, so it's fairly new. Oh, okay. How about the smoke? Uh, we The smoke testing is pretty easy. It's just a small device you put over a manhole and you feed liquid smoke into it. Um, and it just forces it through the system. And... Uh, what they have, what we've gone to is, uh, as Anthony does smoke testing, uh, again, smoke testing needs to be done when it's dry, but as Anthony does smoke testing, he actually tracks the problems that he finds in mobile 3-on-1 so that it's not just on a piece of paper somewhere in a file. We have it, we have any repair that we need to do GPS located, um, so that program is actually going very well. And Routinely, we find something that we have to fix right away. It does happen. So in those cases, he would go fix it immediately. I assume that the camera truck is a capital investment because of its price? Yes. It would be equipment. Yes, sir. But, and we don't see that in? No, sir. That It is calculated into the rate model. Yes. But it falls under the annual budget that's approved for operation maintenance costs. Okay. And I just mentioned that because we would like to support you whenever you think you need new equipment, but if it's we're not being shown it, we can't 
throw our weight behind saying, yeah, we think he really does need that. I understand. What I, what I will say about the city is it has a very good um, life cycle program when it comes to that type of equipment. So they monitor the mileage, the hours, the maintenance that's required, and we life cycle it out when it's necessary. So we do have a very good program um, that we look at, and that's looked at annually also. And last, we're down to the combined water and sewer projects. Um, the coal drive infrastructure project is one of those that's come up because we've had some recent major failures right in the area um, of coal drive and Hargett Street. Um, and to sum it up, most of our patches in that area have patches. Um, it is just a bad area. Um, the, the road is starting to um, depress over the infrastructure significantly. Um, so this project is um, to replace the water and sewer infrastructure um, up to uh, Carver Drive from Hargett Street. Uh, it's looking in our preliminary investigation, it looks like we may have to go slightly past Carver to tie it in um, where we think we'll need to tie it in. And then we would resurface that portion of the entire roadway. Um, what the water and sewer fund would pick up and what you're seeing here, um, make sure I say this correctly so I'm going to get to that page. So of what you see here, and I, I apologize, I should have put this on the slide, um, about 255000 of that would be picked up by the water and sewer fund. And that would be to replace the pipes, the services, and bring it back up to the surface and pave the trench. And then we would use Powell Bill to mill off the rest of what's there and overlay everything. No. Um, you can use Powell Bill... Um, on projects like this, but it's very specific. We cannot use Powell Bill to pave something that um, water and sewer has caused. So we can't go in and cut down, cut and replace the lines and bring it back up and leave the asphalt off and then use Powell Bill to, to cover the asphalt cost. It's got to be, if, if it's a repair, it's got to be fully funded by the water and sewer and then Pal Bill will do the rest of the roadway. So that's why you're seeing the split on your, your piece of paper here. And then the last is um, a partnership with, um, this is an ongoing program, I believe it started last year. And um, the, as you, you know, as you can imagine, the city is very connected, our water, Treatment plant runs everything remotely. To do that, it has to be able to communicate. Um, we have servers that are in um, this building and the Center for Public Safety and other buildings, and all of that has to be connected together. So we have a, a pretty robust fiber network for the city um, that is city-owned, city-used. Um, however, there are redundancies and improvements that need to be made. And, you know, currently we have infrastructure that's still on radio because we don't have any other type of connection to it. Um, one example would be uh, the Northwoods tank. We, Northwoods tank does not have fiber to it. It does, it is actually connected by radio. And anybody familiar with the Northwoods area, we have a lot of trees. So we have a lot of signal interference from the Northwoods tank, um, which does cause problems. In addition, when you're using radio communication, the signal is delayed. Um, one example would be at the water treatment plant, we use it to control Gum Branch Central, which is where all of the Black Creek wells along Gum Branch Road pump to, and then from there we pump it into our system. I, I've been there when they've sent a command and by the time the command goes, is received, acknowledged, and comes back, it takes a couple of minutes. So as you can imagine, when you're trying to run an operation like ours, you know, you have concerns. You want to make sure that you, you get that information back as quickly as possible. So this, you know, this project is in partnership 
uh, with uh, the general fund, it's housed under the Transportation Services Division. And we actually have a uh, stakeholders group that kind of plans out uh, the overall fiber network. And that's what we use to program these type of projects with. And the water and sewer portion of this is only to be used for projects that are support that support water and sewer infrastructure. So those would be, you know, our wells, our lift stations, um, the water treatment plant, our water tanks, or any other type of communication that we need for our water and sewer system. So in summary, we have uh, two projects that are a result of um, NCDO projects. We have eight projects that were started um, prior to 2021. You know, for example, the Western Trunk Sewer um, and uh, Force Main Project, I think we've been working on that project for five or six years now. Uh, and then we have six projects that were actually started in 21, in FY21, the, the current year that we're in. Uh, and then we have three new projects that we're, that we're proposing for the water and sewer capital improvement plan for FY22. So that gets us through the project and capital improvement plan discussion for FY22. If you're okay, what I'd like to do is turn it over to Sabrina and let her talk to you about the projects that we've identified and the budget that we forecasted for our operation and maintenance costs, what that has, what impact that could have on our rates. Can I ask a question going sure. back to the uh, um, finding, making the thing out to finding green, it says sidewalks. Is that the sidewalks going to be paid by Powell Bill? No, it would be, I said he's going to pay for it. It would not be. Sidewalks would not be paid for by water and sewer, so it would either have to be a general fund expense or a power bill expense if it is eligible. Um, and what I don't know... The city will pick up the cost of the, the sidewalks. The city will pay for the cost of the sidewalks. But it may be... Actually, I'll have to get back to you on that because I think there's a thing now where if DOT constructs a road in an area where sidewalks exist that they have to extend it, but I'll have to get back to you. I can't remember. That would be But that would not be covered by water and sewer. Okay. So, Sabrina? Okay. Good evening. I will uh, just give a brief update on the financial portion um, as far as the capital improvement plan goes. Uh, as Wally mentioned, the ca our capital improvement plan includes a lot of projects and different funds, but for the purposes of this discussion tonight, we're just going to talk about the water and sewer projects. We use the capital improvement plan to project out the exp expenditures for projects that we have planned in future years, but the only projects that are actually funded or proposed in the FY22 budget um, are the projects in FY22. And for the FY23 to FY31, those remaining years, they're uh, just forecasted projects that are used for um, planning purposes. And the capital improvement plan is also used in our rate model evaluation, and it's a, a very important part of evaluating our rates. So currently, uh, our monthly bills are based on usage. We have a tiered uh, bill where you have a base bill and then escalates. Uh, the base bill includes 2,000 gallons and then the rate for the usage increases from there. We currently have about 18,200 water customers and uh, 17,600 sewer customers. We, for FY22, project uh, for water and sewer user fees about $24.3 million in revenue. And then our system development fees as Wally mentioned, those can only be used to fund uh, projects that are used or related to growth. And for FY22, we have about $400,000 budgeted for those fees, and those go straight to um, capital reserve fund. And then we have uh, revenue from our cell phone leases. We actually have, uh, on our water towers, we have cell phone corrals, and currently we have seven leases 
with a few different companies and it generates about $366,000 in annual revenue. And our water and sewer rate model, uh, we use it mostly to determine if our rates are sufficient. Uh, it does uh, several different things for us. We use it to estimate our revenue for each year for our budget. We can put in the number of meters that we have based on the meter sizes, the usage that we've had for the previous year, the number of customers, and with all, with all of that information, we're able to more accurately project what our revenue will be for the upcoming year. Will we you get a distortion because of COVID-19 and the people staying at home? Will that have be a usage distortion using last year's? We did not notice a big change in usage. We thought maybe we would with people staying home, but then maybe um, I think what happened is the businesses maybe went down and so it just offset it some, but we, we didn't see a big change with that. And also, I know I came last time and talked about uh, the revenues being still good. And as we are uh, completely through with the payment plan situation. Uh, just to give you an update on that, we I think we had about 149 people that took advantage of the payment plan that we had to offer. And I can't remember the exact number, but I think there's only like 12 or something like that that, we're, that have gone to collection. So uh, that's gone really well also. Uh, in the water and sewer rate model, we also are able to, we key in all of the budgets for the whole water, sewer, and fund, the operation and maintenance budgets. So we have in there uh, the current year budget, the full year estimates, what we're projecting for next year's budget, and that's used to calculate future years as well. And then the capital improvement plan. Uh, it's a very important part of the rate model. We uh, have 10 years, all 10 years in the rate model, and we are able to use that to look at different years. We put all the projects in, and then we can see that if we have too many projects in one year, it's affecting the rates too much. We're able to sort of use that to move projects around, to shift things so that we don't have a huge impact on the rates, and we make sure that our rates can support the projects that are being proposed. And that sort of goes to identifying funding sources. Uh, we're able to look and see if we have large projects in certain years that may require uh, a, another funding source like a, a financing, borrowing, or revenue bond, something of that nature. Well, in that regard, is the uh, what you just presented tonight for FY22 compared to what was proposed last year? It wasn't budgeted, but it was proposed. I know she had three extra projects, but I think they were all $200,000 or less. So was there any, how did the two compare what you had last year proposed and what you have going forward as the budget? I did not look at a direct comparison to see if what we, you know, the exact number of what we had last year matched what we were putting in this year, whether we went up a little bit or down a little bit. I didn't look at that comparison. Typically, um, what I do is um, maybe wear out my welcome with Gail and Sabrina a little bit, mm -hmm. but I spent the better part of probably four or five hours over the period a period of two or two days or so, literally looking at all ten years of projects and us evaluating. Well, what happens if we slide this project one year? What happens if we slide this project two years? Or what happens if we? take our, you know, we realistically, we're seeing uh, the I&I projects done really closer to three years than two years. What does that do to our rate model? So while I didn't look at it, you know, we put an extra 200000 in this year, we try to look at it collectively and we very carefully, you know, move money. And if, they, you know, sometimes you can see it. If you put something in a certain year, and you're, you have excess in that year, you need to re go visit that year. So we not only do we do that for FY22, we do it for the whole 10 years. Because we don't want, while it's all forecast, once you get out that far and it's hard to forecast 10 years, I'll be here in 10 years, or I really want to be here in 10 years, and I don't want to be in front of you saying, surprise! <laughs> so, I'm, you know, I, we put a lot of time into evaluating every year, not just 
Comparing one year to the well, prior. I asked 22 because that's where the rubber meets the road. That, that's you're right. You're going to put the money on the table then. Yes, that's that fine. is correct. That is the year that is funded. But my impression, and again, I didn't do what I'm asking you, but I looked at the three projects. I think that one was 100,000, one was 200,000, the other was 200,000. And then the enterprise fund, $500,000 in a year is not a big deal. That's correct. Okay. Okay. And uh, the water and sewer rate model forecast, our monthly bill, uh, just as Wally just talked about moving those projects around, uh, we're able to, as we move projects, see what that would do to the rates. We're able to see the difference in future years. If we were to do just-in-time increases that we would have to have to support the projects, or if we were doing uh, a set increase like our 2.25% every year, and we're able to see what the bill would be eight years from now doing either way. And we also use it to monitor our bond coverage. Our covenants on our bonds require a certain uh, debt ratio. Our operating revenue has to be enough to cover operations plus our debt service. So we need to monitor that closely so that we make sure we're covered. In the past, we've had presentations from your office that showed us how bonds were going up, 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 but we're supposed to come down at some point. Are we over that hump and are we paying the bond so that there's not so much cost in that? I'm not sure what. What I can say is in the last, um, I'm not sure if this will answer your question, but I'll try. The In the last two years, we've had significant debt fall off. Okay. Um, so that so our our total debt has gone down some. Well, we we had been shown that part of the reason that everything was like it was was because the bonds that you had to take to do things like the water treatment plant were huge, and they had a the things that you were talking about yet have reserves, and we had to have so much money going out there that has nothing to do really with the you know providing the water because it's a structure you bought well, but, and that people were looking for those bonds to go away someday. I know that our uh, target, and I don't know that this is set. I know the target was set from the previous bond issue that we did, which included treatment plant was um, our, our minimum target is like 1.2. Right. So we have to have, so your revenue has to cover 120% of your um, bond payment. Of your, not just that, your payment plus operations. your operations and maintenance. So, and what I can tell you is that that is something that we do monitor very closely. And, um, I, you know, I don't want to give a spoiler for her <laughs> next slide, so I'll wait. <laughs> okay. So the good news is <laughs> that looking at our rate model, um, as Wally said, we have spent a lot of time recently uh, in the last week or two looking at that. And although it's not yet finalized for FY22, it is uh, the projects are financially supportable. Council has adopted a policy to do the uh, increase of 2.25% each year. That still does have to be uh, adopted by council with the budget, and, but we, and we evaluate that annually. But as of right now, um, it is proposed in the FY22 budget. And to this board's credit, that was largely off of a lot of your discussion to avoid some of those big, you know, hits of 20% at one time instead of just a little at a, you know, a little over a longer period. And this is just to show what our rates are currently at the base bill, which is 2,000 gallons or less, and then the 6,000 gallons, which we use for our average bill. And you can see the current rates and the proposed rates. Our base bill for less than 2,000 will go to 54.72, and our average bill will go to 88.09 for the water and sewer portions of the bill. 
And I will mention for those people that have talked to me about their water bill, quote unquote, which is not their water bill, they get confused when they see these numbers and they look at theirs and their base number is $74.52, but that includes a number of other things. And I would just say for our audience and other people who don't know, look at your water bill, it lists out those things that are there. And it's, that's how the city gets that bill to you is in this thing that everybody calls the water and sewer bill. Yes, our, our total utility bill that goes out in a residence pay each month includes water and sewer and trash and stormwater. So you're correct. It's not, you know, if somebody looks at their base bill and says it's not fifty three fifty two right now, well, they'll add another $20 when they consider trash and stormwater. So it's closer to that 73. Right. So with that, we've kind of completed the FY22 uh, capital improvement plan projects presentation. Um, what I would like to get from the board, if you're comfortable, is a recommendation supporting the FY22 projects. Again, the reason for that is because those are the projects that are um, funded in the budget, the upcoming budget. Um, while we do, and then, as Sabrina said, and uh, we use all 10 years of the capital improvement plan, um, and we use 10 years of forecasted operation maintenance when we are looking at the model and we have done that, and I will be bringing the other nine years of projects to you to show you what we have forecasted. Um, what I can say is there hasn't been um, any major additions that we've included in that. I don't think that you haven't already seen or know about. You know, there may be a, a few smaller projects that are in that window. Um, you know, and we do expect things like coal drive, Seminole Trail, um, you know, we do expect those type of projects to pop up, Branchwood. And we do, um, you know, while we don't have specific name projects for some of those, you know, when you see, um, as we're looking at this, when you see fiscal year 23 water line replacement, that's kind of that where we expect to have to do some of that ongoing replacement. You know, so um, as those projects come up in, we have to include those in the future. We will do that. But we kind of do that by either trying to offset other projects or, you know, combine them with other projects. So we try, try to avoid large surprises. Well, if I may pay a compliment to you and your staff, the one thing that is obvious missing out of this is the board hasn't asked you why you didn't include a project which is something that in the past we've had the ability to do, but I take it since I don't have it and I assume my fellow board members don't, your staff has done a great job to identify what are the immediate needs and uh, taking care of the things that need to be taken care of, not pushed out in years, that type of thing for whatever our neighborhoods are. So please pass at least the board's appreciation that they've done such a thorough job for 22. Well, we appreciate that. It does, I think we're, and we still have, a long way to come, but I think we've come a long way by digitally tracking a lot of that work. Um, and, you know, we we're continually trying to evaluate areas like the one that you mentioned tonight. You know, unfortunately, when you have wet, wet weather, <laughs> high groundwater, you know, it tends to highlight some of the challenges we have in our system. And we try to track those and get those repaired. So we appreciate that. The other thing, too, is some work that you started a while ago is paying off. The I&I &I project has, is. that's paying off because it's stuff you're finding and fixing instead of waiting for it to blow up. Yes, ma'am. It's also kept a lot of water out of the system yes, over the last has. couple of years. Yes, it has. <laughs> yeah. I'd like to propose that the board uh, make, I make a motion that the board support the 22, uh, year 22 capital improvement plan to include the three additional uh, projects. I'll second that. All in favor? Aye. All opposed. Aye. Motion carried. Thank you. All right, so we have come to the open discussion. 
section of the meeting if anyone has anything to bring up at this time. I would like to ask if we're prepared and ready for the upcoming season's weather, given what we've had in the past with the rain and everything, and hurricane season won't be too far off. Is there anything the system is, uh, you know, at risk at right now? Because, uh, again, there are a number of cities in other places, like Texas, that their water and sewer is a big issue right now. So we're, we're actually in really good shape. Um, one of the things that we've done... Uh, in preparation for hurricane season is we have an on-call generator contractor that goes around and monitors and does the monthly services that are necessary on our generator. And then um, included in that is an evaluation uh, prior to hurricane season of all of our generators. Now, that doesn't mean it's, it's like any other engine. It could break down at any time. But that gives us the best guarantee that it's going to operate when we need it. Um, and another thing that we do uh, is we exercise all of our generators weekly. So if you ride by City Hall on Thursday morning, you're going to hear the generator outside running. Um, and we do that to make sure that when we lose power, that it'll kick on automatically. We do that at all of our lift stations also. And it's, they're set up and programmed to do that. So I, I think we're, you know, and uh, while it's not water and sewer related, we have a debris management contract already in place. Uh, so if we need help, if we need to bring in a, a contractor, we can literally do it with a phone call. Um, we do a phone call and I can issue a paper notice to proceed when he gets here, um, which is exactly what happened after Florence. Uh, and, you know, if you recall, the city of Jacksonville already had contractors in place going through the city before anywhere else in our area, and it was largely because we had those things in place. Question on our uh, lagoon free board levels, because of all that rain we've had <laughs> this winter. I mean, you had nicely gotten them way down last September and October, and... They're creeping up. Oh, <laughs> they did more than creep. <laughs> um. Well, I, I can't remember the last time we had a almost nine inch rainfall in February. It was wet. So how does that position us for the summer months coming along? Uh, well, we like this week. Yes. We like this week, so, too. I, you know, what I'll say is, you know, knock on wood, we, we didn't have to go into emergency spraying. We didn't get dangerously close to freeboard limits. So we're in, you know, hopefully we'll be in very good shape coming out of next summer. William's wanting to pump and get it down, he I'm is. sure. He is. He's, you know, they do, um, we follow all of the requirements. We, we are in um, close contact with the state. Uh, he has a very good relationship um, with Tom Therrington at the state. So, you know, he, he keeps them posted on what our lagoon levels are and where we're at and, you know, where our concerns are. But, you know, we're hoping, what I will say uh, and what we'll have to do for this board now that we have some new members is set up another tour. Um, we'll just have to figure out how we do that because we typically do it by bus, um, which could be difficult, but um, do another tour. They, they've really put a lot of focus on um, the laterals and maintaining um, the laterals and the infrastructure to where it does help when we have pretty days that we can irrigate and return to irrigation a little bit sooner than we could. This is for the benefit of the new members. It, while it looks like the free board is getting closer, it still represents a couple hundred million gallons of storage capacity that we still have before we're in bad shape. You had so, it figured down to the foot at one point, right? It, and that brain cell is not working today. <laughs> I remember the total was 60, 760 million gallons. Yes. And the number 50, it, 55 uh, million gallons comes to mind per, per foot. foot. Yeah. Okay. Mm. I can tell it to you in acre inches, but you know, that's, <laughs> you have to multiply it out then. So we're, we're not in great shape or we're not in bad shape yet. We don't need many more Februarys. We do not. No. Agreed. Well, in your subject, and we talked, you and I, just briefly before the meeting, the 
the city still has its water conservation program and you can get uh, shower heads, faucet heads for your kitchen. Uh, do they also have the grease uh, caps and scrapers? We still get the grease caps and scrapers. We keep those at water billing. So if you know somebody will have to come to get those, but I think we can give them out through the drive-through. We'll give them out through the drive-through, right? So they can so. get either the um, shower head, water conservation shower head, or the faucet for the kitchen, or the scraper and cap for the can. Yes. And we also give out uh, dye tablets for toilets. If you um, if you want to make sure your toilet's not leaking, you can. We we give out the the little tablets. You just throw in the tank, and if you have color in your toilet, then you've got a leaky toilet. A leaky flapper. Because a lot of times people say correct. it doesn't leak. I don't have water on the floor. Yeah, that's it's right. The flapper part. Flapper. That's right. Yes. All right. Any other topics? Um, our next meeting will be Thursday, April 8th at 5.30 p.m. And at this point, I'd like to ask for a motion to adjourn. Make a motion we adjourn. A second? Second. All in favor? Aye. Opposed? Meeting adjourned. <laughs>